Good evening and welcome to the, all 500 of you. It's a huge crowd tonight. My name is Betsy Wilson and I have the honor of being the Vice Provost and Dean of the University of Washington Libraries. In our increasingly digital world, the doors and the resources of the University of Washington, 16 libraries on three campuses and one island are open to every student, every researcher, and every community member. Our talented staff has deep expertise in literally every field from the arts, humanities, and sciences. And the library is everybody's favorite collaborator and partner, advancing scholarship for the public good. The impact of our libraries is measured in many ways, but one way to feel the scope of the impact is um, we, we broke a record this year. We served 15 million people. Six million people came through the physical doors, and nine million people used the libraries on, uh, digitally on the internet. So we're very proud of that. So every January, there is a special event held that is for, uh, supported by the Friends of the Libraries. And it's a public lecture, and uh, we always look forward to that event to talk with people that, from outside the immediate university community. The one tonight is very special for me, and I, let me tell you why. I moved from the flatlands of Illinois to Seattle in 1992, and when I asked my new colleagues which book should I read to better understand the ethos of the Pacific Northwest and of Seattle? They recommended the likes of Tim Egan's The Good Rain, Murray Morgan's Skid Road, and Shelby Skates' biography of Warren G. Magnuson, and many others. But at the top of the list was this book called No No Boy. So tonight I am thrilled to welcome you for a very special evening. Professor Sean Wong is a longtime friend and longtime friend at the libraries, and I have long been anticipating his talk tonight. It is called No No Boy, the story of how a novel goes from 1,500 copies to 158,000 copies, and I think it's more than that now. Uh, so it's my pleasure first to introduce Dave Stone, who is the president of the Friends of the Libraries. He's going to tell you a little bit about the Friends, then he'll introduce Nicole Mitchell, who will then introduce Sean Wong. Thank you and good evening. It's a real pleasure to welcome all of you here. Uh, we have been doing this for a number of years, and we've never had this attendance before. I don't know whether it's a speaker or just a good marketing. Um, we're overwhelmed by your response, and especially in this day and age when uh, there are a lot of options that people have to spend their time. And we're really thrilled that you chose to spend your time with us this evening. The Friends Board, just to give you a little bit of background, has been around for about almost 40 years. And uh, we're here to increase awareness about the UW library system. We look to, which is, by the way, the largest system west of Chicago and north of San Francisco, which, if you think about it, is a pretty substantial piece of geography. Um, we help stimulate private support. That's always been our mission. And we encourage an appreciation of the current and evolving library services, which have really, really changed recently and an awful lot in the time that I was a student here. The buildings may seem the same, but the services are really not recognizable. By the way, you can become a friend of the library very simply. If you donate more than $100 to the libraries, you become a friend of the library, and that carries with it borrowing privileges at any of our university libraries. And please consider joining us when we present uh, special events uh, throughout the year. Uh, for instance, on February 19th, Professor Michael Biggins will present uh, and discuss items from the East European collections and talk about what he calls the other Europe. On March 19th, if you're in the Palm Springs area, join author and alumnus Eric Wagner as he talks about his new book, 
after the blast, which describes what happened to Mount St. Helens since the eruption. This program will be held at the Rancho Mirage Public Library as part of the UWAA's Dog Days in the Desert program. On May 6th, we'll conduct our annual Libraries Unbound Gala, which will be held in the hub, and the keynote speaker for us this year is Suzanne Orlean, the author of the library book. Tonight, the Friends Board is privileged to continue the tradition of offering timely and insightful programming about uh, items of community interest and especially relevant community interest. And now it's a pleasure for me to introduce Nicole Mitchell, director of the UW Press, who will introduce Sean Wong. Thank you, David. Good evening, everyone, and thank you all so much for coming. What a great crowd we have this evening. As Dave said, I'm Nicole Mitchell, director of the U University of Washington Press. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with our work, UW Press is the oldest and largest publisher of scholarly and general interest books in the Pacific Northwest. We publish compelling and transformative books for a regional, national, and global readership, promoting equity, justice, and inclusion in all of our work. We are committed to the idea of scholarship and books as, as a public good, and we work collaboratively with our authors to produce high-quality books that educate, spark conversation, and inspire new work. As of this month and throughout 2020, we are and will be celebrating 100 years of serving the University of Washington. It is my honor to introduce a hugely influential figure on our campus and in our literary community this evening. Professor Sean Wong currently teaches Asian American literature in the Department of English and beginning in advanced screenwriting in the Department of Comparative Literature, Cinema and Media here at the University of Washington. Describing himself first and foremost as a writer, Sean has published two novels, Home Based and American Knees, both currently published by UW Press. A feature film version of American Knees, directed by Eric Beiler and titled American Ease, was released in 2013, winning several film festival awards. Sean is also co-editor and, ed co -editor, and editor of six literary anthologies, including the pioneering collection IE, an anthology of Asian American writers, just reissued last month by UW Press with a new introduction by Professor Tara P Fickle. Over the course of his distinguished career, Sean has garnered numerous awards from such prestigious organizations as the National Endowment for the Arts, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Society of Professional Journalists, the Pacific Northwest Booksellers Association, and the South by Southwest Film Festival. I should take a moment here to mention that all of Sean's books and others that will be highlighted tonight will be available to sale through the University uh, bookstore, um, which has a table upstairs, uh, immediately following Sean's talk. In addition to his many literary successes, for decades, Sean has been an advocate and activist for Asian American studies. In the 1970s, Sean co-founded the Combined Asian American Resources Project, known as CARP, with writer colleagues Frank Chin, Jeffrey Paul Chan, Lawson in and Lawson Inada. CARP worked for years to promote the work of a multi-generational cohort of important and largely overlooked Asian American writers, struggling against the ingrained racism of the publishing industry at the time and the public at large. CARP organized the very first Asian American Writers Conference in 1975, held at the Oakland Museum, and the group's deep archives are to this day informing the work of scholars and authors. So thanks to Sean Wong and others, and for more than 40 years, the press has been able to bring back into print more than a dozen foundational works of, by Asian American authors, reintroducing them for a new generation of readers. By far the most commercially successful of these works has been No No Boy by John Okada, which has sold more than 160,000 copies since the press took on its publication in 1979. As you may know, the press's edition of No No Boy and other classic works such, such as Carlos Bulasan's America is in the Heart 
recently received major media coverage as a result of, pu of publishing dispute with Penguin Classics. Sean's activism around protecting the intellectual property of the Okada family and the press's right to publish resulted in features in the New York Times, the LA Times, the New Yorker, just to name a few media outlets. The press continues to publish books in our Classics of Asian American Literature series. This spring, we will republish the 1961 novel, Eat a Bowl of Tea, sorry, by Lewis Chu, which is regarded as the first novel to capture the tone and sensibility of everyday life in an American Chinatown. I'm delighted to announce that this new novel will be the first book to be supported by a new Sean Wong Fund for books in Asian American studies. Before I turn things over to Sean, I'd like to recognize at Sean's request, uh, journalist and writer Frank Abe, who is here in the front row, um, who recently, <laughs> Frank, who recently co-edited with Greg Robinson and Floyd Chung, John Okada, The Life and Rediscovered Work of the Author of No-No Boy. Frank will be available to answer questions about No-No Boy and signed books following Sean's talk. Please join me in welcoming Sean Wong. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nicole. Everybody hear me? Good. Um, I, first, I would like to thank um, the Friends of the Library for inviting me to speak at their annual lecture uh, and to the UW Alumni Association, which uh, chose No No Boy to be uh, uh, the, uh, part of their book club. I believe there's 12,000 members of the book club. So I'm waiting uh, for uh, uh, the UW Press and I are waiting eagerly for that uh, sales figure. Um, and also uh, for the Alumni Association for publishing the excellent article on No No Boy uh, in the uh, UW Magazine written by Vince uh, Schleitweiler. Um, and also, as uh, Nicole said, it's the 100th birthday of the uh, University of Washington Press. So uh, let me get started with my story here um, about No-No Boy. And uh, the, the main thing I think I want to say uh, about No-No Boy and the, this particular story, as Nicole said, I'm a fiction writer. So the first thing I want to say is most of what you're going to hear tonight is true. <laughs> or as the movie industry says, it's based on a true story. <laughs> and as a storyteller, I might take a few liberties with the truth uh, in order to make it a better story. Um, in this case, I'm the main character. <laughs> so I come off really well in the story. <laughs> Um, as uh, Nicole mentioned, the sales figure has to be changed here to 160,000 copies now. Uh, no, no, boy. Uh, when I was a young writer, an undergraduate at Berkeley, uh, I had a lot of hair. <laughs> and uh, I was an English major at Berkeley. And at Berkeley, the English major meant that you studied British literature, and that's all. They threw in a couple of Irishmen, and that was it. I took a whole year of American literature, and it didn't count towards my major, because that wasn't literature. Right? I took a class in Chekhov, didn't count towards my major. I took creative writing, didn't count towards my major. You can see I'm fairly bitter. So I wanted to be a writer, right? And I decided at age 19 I wanted to be a novelist. I wanted to write books. And so I went to my American literature professor, and I said, I want to, write, I want to read books about me, Asian American writers, right? And I realized at that very moment I was the only Asian American writer I knew in the entire world. No English professor ever mentioned the name of an American writer of Asian ancestry. 
No high school teacher ever mentioned one. Uh, no Asian American book was ever assigned uh, to us. So I was the only Asian American writer I knew. Think about that. And I was unpublished. <laughs> and I wasn't very good. I'm a writer now. Please go upstairs and buy my books. <laughs> so here I am typing away at my novel. And one of the things I think that's in, important is that I, I went to my English professor, and they said, and he said, there, there aren't any books. Just simply flat, there aren't any. And so I said, that can't be true. We've been living, Chinese Americans have been living in America for 150 years at that point. We built a railroad. Somebody must have written a poem. <laughs> you know, a short story, something, right? You don't build a, a railroad over the Sierras and not write a poem about it. Right, so, um, he did tell me, oh wait, I know of a book. And he went to a shelf and he pulled off uh, an anthology of the Tang Dynasty poets. <laughs> I'm looking at him and goes, that's in China. <laughs> that was 900 years ago, you know? Plus, I've already read those poets. All they did was drink wine and fall drunk in the river, right? So, it was the 60s. I had already done that. <laughs> and so did many of you. <laughs> I can tell you've read Li Po. OK, so I went to the library. I went to the UC, since we're, this is sponsored by libraries, I went to the library. And guess what? In 1969, Google was not invented. I went to this thing called the card catalog. <laughs> but in order to use the card catalog, you had to know three things. The name of the author, the title of the book, the subject. I, of course, didn't know the name of the author. I didn't know the title of the book. But I knew the subject, Asian American literature. So I went to the A drawer. No such subject. Librarians, sorry, Betsy, librarians were no help. Right? So where do you look? I looked, I went, I decided I'm going to have to go out into the street and find, find these writers. Somebody must have written a book. And so in the meantime, I ran into three uh, young writers, Frank Chin, Jeff Chan, and Lawson Inada. Lawson Inada was a published poet, a Japanese-American poet, lived in Ashland, Oregon. Uh, Frank Chin had published a short story, and Jeff Chan, unpublished graduate student. And the four of us started looking for Asian-American literature. So we went to the used bookstores, and we started combing through the used bookstores. If you come to my office in Pedelford Hall, I have the world's largest collection of racist books about Chinatown, you know, Charlie Chan books, you name it, I bought it. One day, I ran across this book, No No Boy. It was in a used bookstore for sale for 50 cents. And I didn't know what it was about, but, you know, like most readers, I judged it by its cover. And, uh, it, it didn't look good. Uh, you know, like, uh, I was trying to decipher what the title meant. Uh, and uh, my friends and I, we actually put it aside for a second and didn't, uh, didn't read it. Um, and then one day we read it. And we realized we had found our first serious Asian American work. Uh, those of you who have read it know that it's about Seattle. It's about a young man, Japanese-American man, who comes back to Seattle after World War II, after serving um, 
two years in concentration camp and two years in prison for refusing, for resisting the draft. And um, when we read it, we realized it was, uh, we didn't know if it was Japanese America's uh, first novel, but it was certainly Japanese, uh, the first Asian American novel that we read that we felt um, a real connection with. Uh, we were looking for our own literary history. And we were looking for that generation of writers who came before us. <clears throat> and so we wrote to the publisher. It was published by Charles Tuttle Company in 1957. And um, Charles Tuttle, this is a picture of John Okada, who, if you don't know, is a graduate of the University of Washington, grew up in Seattle, his uh, parents ran a hotel in Pioneer Square on First Avenue. Um, Okada, uh, so we wrote to the publisher, Charles Tuttle, and asked him uh, for information about uh, John Okada. And remember, I'm still uh, an undergraduate at Berkeley. And uh, Charles Tuttle sent us entire correspondence file uh, that he had with John Okada. And in the file was a letter. The novel of which I send you a few pages deals with Hajime, who later his name is changed to Achiro, a Nisei who has gone to prison for having refused the draft and faces the problem of finding his way back into the American stream of life. His error, his act of treason, if we might call it such, can never, fully, uh, never be fully rectified. The reasons for his refusal are many and varied. There is the bitterness of the evacuation, the unrelenting pressure of his fanatically pro-Japanese mother, the faith in his country, which has been shattered, and the ugliness of the knowledge of a prejudice hateful and mighty enough to uproot a thousand seemingly American homes. There is no final answer, of course. There never is for treason. Yet America is the only home that he knows, and there is some comfort in the thought that his own mistake was no more detestable than the mistake of the nation which doubted him in the moment of crisis. And so we decided, the four of us, to try to find Okada. And uh, in the letter it said he lived in Los Angeles, and so being great literary researchers, we looked in the phone book. <laughs> and there he was, John Okada. So we called the phone number. And his wife, Dorothy, answered the phone. And we said, oh, you know, we just read John's book. Uh, we're a bunch of writers, and we'd really like to talk to him. We'd like to interview him uh, and learn something about his life as a writer. Um, and uh, we're collecting, you know, Asian American authors' books, um, and we're working on an anthology of Asian American literature. Um, and she told us over the phone, uh, you're too late. Uh, John died a few months ago, a heart attack at age 47. And we said, well, we want to come down anyway. Right? So we flew down there. And in the correspondence file with Charles Tuttle, uh, Okada mentioned, actually in this letter, mentioned that he was working on a second novel about the first generation Japanese Americans, the Issei. And so when we uh, talked to, when we met Dorothy, we asked her about the, the second novel that Okada was working on. And she said, she sat there for a second and she said, I offered all of John's papers to UCLA, but they had never heard of him, and so I burned everything. I had the same reaction. I wanted to choke her. Yes, she's the wife of John Okada, but I wanted to choke her, or cry, or do something, right? And so we, we decided it was our mission, you know, to, to not only record the lives of these writers who came before us, the generation before us, but we also wanted to um, 
get their work rediscovered, get their work republished. Um, and uh, because um, they were part of American literature. And so eventually in 1974, the four of us authored the very first anthology of Asian American literature. That's us pretending we're a rock band. <laughs> uh, that picture is on the back of, the, of this book. This book was published in 1974, and uh, it was published by Howard University Press in Washington, DC. Uh, nobody would publish our anthology. We went from publisher to publisher. And then Howard University Press had just started a publishing company and they read the manuscript to our anthology and decided that it would be one of their first 10 books that they published in their first year of uh, publishing. And uh, the book came out and ended up being reviewed everywhere. Uh, New York Times, The New Yorker. We were even in the Rolling Stone, probably because of that picture. <laughs> um, I'm 25 years old. We're in the Rolling Stone. My career was done. <laughs> right. so, um, so we thought, well, with the success of this book, we should be able to get all of these books by the older generation of writers back in print and back on the bookshelves, right? Wrong. We started with No, No Boy. We went from publisher to publisher. No, no, no. Thus the title, No, No Boy. <laughs> we went to Random House, we went to Doubleday, you name it. And then we went to the University of Washington Press because it makes sense, right? University of Washington Press, the book is written by University of Washington Press graduate, takes place in Seattle. Perfect storm. University of Washington Press said no. They didn't think it would sell. Me being a young writer in the 20s did not like rejection. So I got a letter campaign going, right? People wrote in, journalists wrote in, you know, and then the UW Press contacted me and they said, okay, we'll publish it if you pay us $5,000. <laughs> I don't have $5,000, right? I'm not a businessman, but I said to my friends, Jeff, Frank, and Lawson, if we pay ourselves $5,000, we could publish it ourselves, <laughs> right? Let's skip the middleman, right? Let's skip the middleman. Oops. So we did. We called ourselves the Combined Asian American Resources Project, CARP. It's kind of an Asian fish, you know? <laughs> and we uh, went into the first printing of 3,000 copies in 1976. Uh, we were not great business people, but uh, when you go to the printer, uh, you have to pay 50% down. We got a friend of ours, Bob Onadera, graphic designer, uh, to design the cover and, and uh, design the inside of the book for us. And we had enough money to go to the printer, but we did not have the other 50% when it came off the printer, from the printers. Um, I wasn't thinking that far ahead at that time. I just figured it'll all work out, you know? Um, and so while we were, when we took it to the printer, I contacted um, a writer for the Pacific Citizen, which is the uh, uh, national newspaper for the Japanese American Citizens League. And we didn't have enough money for an ad, but I asked the columnist if, uh, I asked one of the columnists if he could mention our book in his column. And uh, if people sent in money, I would give them $2 off the cover price for pre-publication sale. 
And for some reason, I had set the price of the book at $5.95. <laughs> so that meant it was, they were going to buy it for $3.95. The math was not working out, you know. <laughs> I'm Asian. I should know math, you know. <laughs> There's a guy running for president that's flaunting that. <laughs> so I said, so what we realized, though, what started to happen was people started to send us letters. I started receiving hundreds of letters with checks in them. It turned out that it was a book that all of Japanese America had heard about, but nobody read. And what happened was the entire first printing of 3,000 copies were sold entirely by mail order, almost 95% to Japanese American readers. You would see the, the addresses on the checks, and then you would see another one, like from the house next door, and then another one from the house next door to that. And I would say 75% of the readers were in Gardena, California. Um, we didn't even sell a single copy of the first printing to a bookstore because I would have to give a discount to the bookstore. I'm not giving discounts. Right? So um, we restarted getting all of these letters um, and people would tell us stories about the book in these letters. And I saved them all. I saved every letter. What you need to know, too, is that we made enough money to go into a second printing immediately. And, uh, and then I started to sell to bookstores. We did not have a distributor. I was the distributor. In fact, the trunk of my Mustang was the distributor. <laughs> I should have never sold that car. <laughs> Do you know how much car that, that car is worth now? 66 Mustang GT, oh my God, it's worth more than No-No Boy. Anyway, that was my distribution network. Uh, the first printing, I threw them in the trunk of that Mustang. I wrote every invoice. I put stamps on every uh, mailer. I wrote every label and I threw them in the back of my Mustang and took them down to the post office during Christmas season in San Francisco in 1976, right? Um, and then I took the second printing, loaded it up in my Mustang, and moved to Seattle. And when I moved to Seattle, a local reporter, Mayumi Sudakawa, who was writing for the Seattle Times, wrote an article about me. There's another vintage picture of me. And I told the story that I just told you about the University of Washington Press asking me for $5,000 in the Seattle Times. <laughs> I had just moved to town. I was still angry. So. The next day, I get a call from this man, Don Elgood, the director of the University of Washington Press. He calls me on the phone, Naomi Pascal's editor-in-chief. Don calls me and he says, I read that article in the Seattle Times. We would like to have a meeting with you. <laughs> when are you available to meet? I'm like, oh man, I just moved to Seattle. I'm on unemployment. I have all the time in the world. <laughs> so I say, I'm going to check my schedule. Because, <laughs> man, I'm in trouble now. So I pretend to walk down the hall, and I come back to the phone, and I said, um, I'm able to meet a week from Tuesday. Seem. 
the kind of thing you would say if you're busy. <laughs> so a week from Tuesday rolled around, and I'm ushered into a conference room and told to sit at the head of the conference table. And <coughs> the entire staff of the University of Washington Press is sitting around the conference table. Yes, one of them looks like Putin. And they're looking at me, everybody's staring at me. And I realize, you know, maybe I shouldn't have said that in the Seattle Times. <laughs> and Don Elgood stands up, stands over me, and he says, on behalf of the press, the first thing I would like to say to you is how sorry we are for the way we treated you and your book. OK. <laughs> This is looking good now. <laughs> I have the upper hand. I'm a young writer and a publisher who looks like Putin <laughs> is apologizing to me, right? And I go, well, it's OK. And he says, so to make amends, we would like to publish the book now. I got up out of my chair. I said, do you know how much trouble I went through to publish that book? I mailed out 3,000 copies at Christmas time. I filled out every invoice. I put stamps on every mailer, 3,000 damn books, right? I was mad. If you had just decided to publish that, I would not have had to do that, right? So I said, why don't you, there's other books that have the same story as No, No Boy. Why don't you publish those? And here they are, right? Toshio Mori's Yokohama, California. Right. Toshio Mori's Yokohama, California. I didn't have them with me that day, but America's in the heart. Frontiers of love, Nisei daughter, right? If I had them with me, I would have thrown them on the table just like that. So guess what the University of Washington Press did? They started to publish them. In fact, one day I was walking down uh, the Ave, and Bruce Wilcox, one of the editors at University of Washington Press stopped me on the street, on the sidewalk, and said, hey, Sean, uh, we're thinking of publishing uh, Nisei Daughter by Monica Sone. Uh, does CARP have any plans on publishing it? <laughs> and, and I said, no, because we have no money. Uh, he says, would it be OK if we published it? Why ask me, you know? Anyway, I said, sure. <laughs> and so they did. Right? And, and uh, uh, so several years later, in 1979, I transferred the rights of Nono Boy over to the University of Washington Press. And for the last 40 years, they've been publishing Nono Boy. And they have sold 160,000 copies, right? 60,000 copies. Um, and uh, it's been a great relationship and a great story uh, about uh, the success of a book that I believed was part of my uh, literary history. And uh, everything was going swimmingly well until last year when Penguin Classics announced that they were publishing No No Boy. Last spring, they announced they're publishing No No Boy. 
I heard this news. Frank Abe heard this news. It's like, no, they can't do that. They can't do that. When I published No No Boy with CARP, I copyrighted the book. Right. I filled out the form, sent it to the Library of Congress. In fact, I still had the form because I th never throw anything away. <laughs> and I said, so Penguin was claiming that the book was in the public domain and that anybody could publish it. And they never contacted the UW Press. They never contacted the Okada family. I was outraged, you know? This book was part of my literary history. I published this book. All right. I copyrighted it. But Penguin was saying that I didn't fill out the copyright form correctly. Bullshit. <laughs> I was mad. I call up the University of Washington Press, you know, I march down there, I sit down at the conference table. <laughs> the same people are there. <laughs> so I sit down at the conference table and I say, tell me this is, what happened here, right? And they said, well, Penguin has determined that uh, the book is in the public domain and they've published No No Boy. And uh, I said, that, that just can't be, they can't do that, you know? And, and so we're sitting there and uh, Nicole Mitchell, director of the UW Press, who looks nothing like Putin, Thank God. Uh, <laughs> she, she says, well, you know, we're a public university. You know, we really can't fight a legal battle. Um, and um, uh, I said, well, we can't do nothing, you know. Not only that, Penguin is not paying royalties to the Okada estate, the Okada family. That, that is just wrong. They can't steal a book that has been part of my life for 50 years, right? So everybody was sitting there, all of them. <laughs> if you've never been to the University of Washington Press, they're very professional. <laughs> lack, a little, lack a little diversity, you know, but <laughs> they're very professional. And they said, well, there's only so much we can say, but you, Sean, you're a private citizen. You can do anything you want. And I go, got it. And so I got out of the chair and I went back to my office in Padelford Hall and I started a social media shaming campaign of the likes <laughs> you have never seen. And my first post on May 31st, after I left my meeting with Putin, <laughs> I wrote, on December 10th, 1976, I copyrighted the novel No No Boy on behalf of Dorothy Okada, the widow of John Okada, in preparation for publishing the CARP edition of the novel when no publisher would issue, reissue the book. We used our own money to publish No No Boy. This month, Penguin released their version of No No Boy, claiming that the novel is in the public domain, thus bypassing, bypassing consultation with the Okada family and stepping on the University of Washington Press version of the book, which they have been publishing for 40 years, following the Carp edition and have sold 157,000 copies. Shame on Penguin for narrowly interpreting my copyright for their own financial gain and without consulting the Okada family. Right. And I pressed send. 
And then my friend, Vince Scheitweiler, in the office above me in Pedelford Hall, sends me an email. Great posting, Sean, but if you want people to read it, you must make it public. <laughs> Only your friends can see that. So I email him back, how do I do that? <laughs> and he says, there's a little globe. <laughs> you click on the globe. And so what you have here is the globe version <laughs> of my friend's post. And then, two days later, I found the copyright form, and I said, more about the no-no boy copyright. In 1976, blah, 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 you know, and uh, again, I say, um, that's a truly narrow interpretation and an interpretation solely for the financial gain of Penguin so that they can bypass both my copyright and the Okada family. That is a moral outrage, right? Now I'm on a roll, right? <laughs> More on No No Boy, June 3rd, the next day. This novel, perhaps more than any other novel in Asian American history, has a history. I'm part of the publishing history of this book. Reprinting, blah, 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 you know, and um, I started telling the story of this book when I discovered it in 1972. The greatest travesty is that Penguin ignored that literary history. All of it. For what? For corporate financial gain. There's a deep history behind this book that includes the Okada family and nearly every Asian American writer. The pirating of Nono Boy by Penguin is deeply hurtful, which was true. And then I decided, and Penguin ripped off the original cover design of the 57 first printing of Nono Boy. Their abuse of Asian American literary history is unmatched and unconscionable. That one just went to my friends, apparently. <laughs> I'll have to fix that tonight. <laughs> the publishing history of No No Boy, same day, is part of the Asian American literary history, and that story is almost as important as the novel itself. For Penguin to publish the novel without that story is proof they have no sense of that literary story and history. Do they realize that nearly every Asian American writer has probably read a UW Press edition or a carp edition of the novel over the past 43 years? The novel is a symbol of what we do when we put pen to paper. Okada was ignored. Right? Nobody does outrage like me. Right? <laughs> and the publishing history was so well known that it appeared in a novel by Karen Tay Yamashita, The Eye Hotel. And in The Eye Hotel, I am a fictional character named Paul. And in a excerpt from that novel, Paul knew how to collect rent, write up contracts, keep accounting books, carry out a will. Maybe Jack or some other poet made the contacts, but Paul followed through got the contact, contract signed, deposited, and signed checks, printed letterhead, licked the stamps on the envelopes. Boy, did I do that. <laughs> he had learned from Edmund about press releases and advertising. It was business on the one hand. On the other, he had learned something from editing Edmund's memorial tape. It was like Chen had suggested. You tell a story. Pieces for the anthology arrived along with interviews of the authors. A new introduction and afterward for the Okada reprint had to be written and proofed. Paul poured over the material and meticulously edited everything. He got the confidence to get Kamiyama to pull back on the nostalgia and to make Jack accept cutting out whole paragraphs of run-on blather. That's Frank Chin. The whole operation <laughs> looked professional, but it was Paul schlepping books to the post office in the back of his green Mustang. That car was famous, so famous it ended up in a novel. And I wrote to Karen Yamashita and I said, the car was yellow, not green. 
And Karen said, Sean, it's a work of fiction. <laughs> I made it green because Steve McQueen drove a green Mustang in the movie Bullet. My wife, sitting in the front row, said, you need a hashtag. And I go, what's a hashtag? <laughs> Penguin's website notes, celebrate Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month with four Penguin classics by Carlos Bulasong, Young Hill Ken, H.T. Sang, and John Okada. A direct quote from their website. The Okada and Bulasan books are currently being published by the University of Washington Press, and the Kang and Tsang books are currently being published by Kaya Press, an Asian American independent publisher. Penguin's way of celebrating Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month is by trampling on an independent publisher and a university press, both with long, long histories of publishing Asian American literature. I'd like to ask Penguin as, as to how exactly did that editorial meeting and dialogue go when considering what to publish? No, no, Penguin. <laughs> so the, uh, <laughs> now I was gonna run with no, no, Penguin. And so, uh, I tell the story about how Alcada had been ignored, uh, how we did rediscover the book, uh, and of course the, the history of our carp edition. And then at the bottom I say, for Penguin to so narrowly interpret my copyright for their financial advantage and to sidestep the Okada family's involvement in their printing is so outrageously morally wrong, I feel I need to stand up once again and fight on behalf of this novel a novel that marked the beginning of my own literary career and those of many, many other Asian American writers. And then the other writers started to get involved. Pulitzer Prize winning author Viet Nguyen has just posted the following on Twitter. I am very disappointed in Penguin Classics, Penguin Books, Penguin USA for appropriating John Okada's No No Boy. I teach No No Boy in all my Asian American literature courses. I will continue to use the University of Washington Press edition, encourage all of you to do the same. Elda Roeder, who is the director of Penguin Classics, I hope Penguin will reconsider this because the look of this is very bad. This is Viet Nguyen, and he put it out there, and things started to change. <laughs> David Henry Wong, Tony Award winning author, also joined the fight on social media. Social media is a great tool. <laughs> you don't have to go to court. You just do this. And then, the New York Times called me. Alexandra Alter called me, and she said, she interviewed me for two hours on the phone. And of course, her angle in the story was, University of Washington English professor takes on the world's largest publisher, <laughs> right? David versus Goliath, right? So, and then she told me, I'm sending a photographer over to your house. When the photographer arrived, I said, do you want my mad face? <laughs> he said, uh, let's do concerned, not mad. <laughs> so that's my concern face. That's the face in my classroom here at the UW. So, Alexandra told me, she goes, um, all right, we're working on this. If any other news media calls you, let me know. We want to be first. All right. Okay. <laughs> You're the New York Times? Okay. I didn't think anybody would call. 
And then two days later, I'm calling Alexandra. I said, you need to get this story out. I can't hold these people off. <laughs> I said, I'm going to grant an interview in two days. Please get this story out. And they did. And then NBC ran the story. And then the LA Times ran the story. And then <laughs> <clears throat> Not quite as mad. The Seattle Times ran, Maura McDonald, the Seattle Times ran the story on the front page of the newspaper, right? Um, and then, I love this, the American Studies Association Executive Committee released a statement regarding John Okada's Nono Boy. And this is a statement essentially to all the professors who would probably use Nono Boy in their classes. Penguin Classics' actions remind us of the importance of the publication industry to national identity and likewise, the importance of our continuing critical engagement with it. Very scholarly. <laughs> we encourage our members to use the occasion of this renewed attention, however contestatory, to Nono Boy to re-engage the novel. The themes prominent in it, including the inextricable links between the securing of US sovereignty and racism under the banner of national security and the conditions and characteristics of giving rise to militaristic masculinity and that justify militarism resonate strongly, certainly in the current context, but also in our apprehension of the history of the US nation as a whole. We are reminded of the histories of removal, confinement, and dispossession of indigenous peoples. We are reminded of the differential citizenship assigned to black people. We are reminded of the camps proliferating on the US nation's south southwestern border. We are reminded of the separation of family members from each other. We are, in short, reminded of the violence that has always and continues to proceed in the name of national security. In short, we remind all of us of the novel's importance to our collective efforts as scholars, teachers, and students to deepen understanding of US culture and politics. And then Elda Roeder wrote a letter to me. The pressure was getting to her. A new no novo development. Following the New York Times article, Elda Roeder, vice president and publisher of Penguin Classics, wrote to me, I am not going to publish her letter, but I will post my one paragraph response to her. Dear Ms. Roeder, Thank you for taking the time to write to me and to articulate Penguin's position, both legally and philosophically. I can see in your letter that you're just stating your position and are not seeking a dialogue. I will just put these brief thoughts in one paragraph and we can both move on. I am so calm. <laughs> I am neither the author of the novel, nor a member of the Okada family, nor on the staff of the University of Washington Press. So I understand that a dialogue with me isn't necessary. I'm just a private citizen, borrowing something Nicole told me, <laughs> who championed a novel I thought everyone should read before I became a published writer myself. In my 20s, I delivered, again, out of the trunk of my Mustang. I did not have the resources you and your company enjoy. John Okada died in 71, just months before I phoned the Okada household and spoke to his wife, Dorothy. He died thinking his novel was ignored, neglected, and forgotten. I vowed to bring the book back into print. His work legitimizes what I do as an Asian American writer. It's my literary history. I don't have a marketing team or a legal team. Legal interpretations aside, you know and I know that I filled out the 76 copyright form in good faith and answered the questions on the form accurately and correctly. Why would I use my own money to publish a book I love and not copyright it? You know the answer. I will say the following once, and I don't need an answer. 
Penguin should recall all the copies of Nono Boy and withdraw it from distribution and donate the copies to libraries worldwide. Decency over commerce. With that effort, you will, to use your own words, spark new controversies, conversations, <laughs> teach a wider audience of readers, and increase an awareness of John Okada's legacy. You have the right values, just the wrong execution with the wrong book. And then the bookstores jumped in. <laughs> Elliott Bay Book Company, Finney Books, Third Place Books, U, uh, University uh, Bookstore, uh, all returned their copies of Penguin's book and would only sell the University of Press version. And then things started to crack at Penguin. Penguin called the UW Press and said, we would like to make an offer to the Okada family, even though they don't have to because the books are in the public domain, according to them, right? So the UW Press contacts the Okada family. Okada family does not want to talk to Penguin. Why should they? They already have a publisher, right? So any offer that Penguin wanted to make to the Okadas as restitution would have to go through the University of Washington Press. And so they made an offer to be passed on to the Okada family, a financial settlement. <clears throat> I am not going to tell you how much that settlement was. It would be rude of me to tell you what that settlement was. But I will tell you that it could buy this car. a 2005 Ford Taurus SE from Portland. So I'm not going to reveal how much they offered, but it made me mad. It made me really mad. And the press was mad. Right? And we were not going to tell the Okada family what that offer was because that's insulting. A Ford Taurus. They were offering a Ford Taurus. <laughs> so, after the New York Times article was published, a lawyer of copyright law contacted the UW Press um, attorney. And she's a Columbia law professor of international copyright law. And she said, this case is really convoluted and it's really interesting, but you actually have a case and here's why. And only a copyright lawyer would know this. And her name, Jane Ginsburg. And she does Professor of Literary Artistic Property Law. And without going into the, all the details of copyright law, she, in, she said, here's why you have a case if you can prove one thing. And that one thing was uh, the book first went on sale in Japan. If it did not go on sale in America for 30 days or more, then the copyright is still in force. Right? Something to that effect. And Frank Abbe, the keeper of all documents and all facts, unlike me, uh, was able to prove that like in 30 seconds. Right? <laughs> And so she made a determination that the copyright was still in force. Right? But Penguin has a whole room full of lawyers, right? But Jane Ginsburg has a mother. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, this fight got really good now. You know? I'm the little kid, you know? There's a tiger standing behind me. Come on, let's fight, you know? 
Penguin did not want this story in the press. <laughs> they gave up. They gave up. <laughs> to make a long story short, Penguin Classic withdrew all copies of No No Boy from distribution in the US. Penguin Classics will pay royalties to the Okada family for all copies of the books delivered to bookstores in the US prior to withdrawing it from distribution and for all copies sold abroad. This fight with Penguin Classic could not have been won without the help of all those who put social media pressure on Penguin, the UW Press, John Okada biographer Frank Abe, and co-editor of the anthology of, uh, 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 of John Okada, which is uh, available upstairs. But the New York Times wasn't done. Um, just last November in T Magazine, the Style Magazine, they uh, told not only the story of John Okada's Nono Boy, but also of, um, of Japanese American um, uh, literature. And then uh, the UW Press, uh, UW Magazine published this great story on the legacy of Nono Boy, and the UW Press just published um, the uh, a new printing of our anthology that started all of the uh, attention of Nono Boy uh, in honor of its 45th anniversary, and. Um, um, and which was just reviewed in the New Yorker magazine um, on a few weeks ago, and uh, calling us the can American cannon breakers. Um, I know many of you have unread New Yorker magazines on your coffee table <laughs> because the damn thing comes every week. I can see the guilty faces right now. <laughs> so pick up the December 30th issue, and you'll see this great article. And to sort of wind up, um, I heard from Frank Abbe that Elda Roeder was coming to the Modern Language Association convention um, in Seattle uh, this, a few weeks ago. And so I wrote to Elda Roeder. And I wrote to her and I said, Dear Elda, <laughs> Frank Abe tells me that you'll be attending the MLA conference in Seattle. I wanted to invite you to the book launch event for IE, an anthology of Asian American writers, in celebration of its 45th anniversary by the UW Press. And perhaps we might have a chance to meet without the controversy of No No Boy. IE was once published by Penguin, as well as the big IE. Sincerely, Sean. And she responded, and she said, I'll be there. Right? And she came, and we shook hands. It's easy to shake hands when you won. <laughs> we shook hands, and I said, Elda, I'm on your side. I have nothing against you. I support your efforts to publish Asian American literature. This was just the wrong book. But going forward, I support you. You can ask me for advice. I'd be happy to help you. She said, thank you. And nobody took a picture of us. <laughs> They're all standing there. Nobody lifted their phone and took a picture of us shaking hands. So. Uh, as, um, as Nicole mentioned, uh, the final thing is um, uh, I am started my own book series, uh, and this is Chinese America's version of No No Boy. It's a classic tale of New York's Chinatown by Louis Chu, originally published in 1961. It's been out of print for many, many years, and so I started a book fund. And Guess how much the check was for? $5,000. <laughs> In 40 years, the price never went up. 
not even for inflation. You know, that was a good deal. I am paying 1977 prices, you know, in 2020. So uh, uh, this will be the first book in a series of books uh, with my name on it, and I am proud to be part of the University of Washington Press family. Um, thank you so much, and um, I know we've run out of time for questions, but I'll be up by the um, uh, book table upstairs. Uh, my mother would love it if you bought my novel. Uh, <laughs> And I'll be happy to answer questions there. Thank you so much. And the Thank you, Sean. That was wonderful. Um, the books are available for sale up in front of the Walker Ames room on the second floor. Uh, if you are a friend of the UW Library or the press and you received an invitation to the uh, uh, VIP reception, that will also be held in the, in the Walker Ames room. Thank you for coming and travel safely. Thank you.